College Football Nerds, we're talking Kentucky. We are talking Auburn. It's been a while. We missed y'all. We're glad to be back. Auburn fans, we usually do a preview for you in the summer. Uh, we didn't get around to it this year, so we apologize because of all the craziness. Uh, we at least have that excuse. Um, Josh is with me. We're talking about Kentucky and Auburn. We were talking about kind of comparing notes before we started this, and, you know, a lot of people see Kentucky on the schedule now and, and they saw Alabama add Kentucky and Auburn add Kentucky when they shuffled the schedules and people are rolling their eyes like, oh, giving them a layup, protecting your bigs. But in the last few years, that hasn't been the case. Um, we're two years removed from Kentucky winning 10 games, beating Penn State uh, in, in, a, in a meaningful bowl game. Last year, they were a team that was a tough out, which I think kind of is important for this game. So the thing I want you to talk about first, Josh, is just how, given all that we've seen so far with rust and teams coming out ugly out of the gate, in most normal years, given these two teams, in most normal years when you have a defensive team playing a team like an Auburn who is also a defensive team that isn't coming off a great offensive year, there's some concern that you can get a weird game. I don't want you to get into your anything under 25, 20 points can get sideways. But in this year where you've got defensive teams and you got all the wackiness that we've seen from offensive rust, this could be a closer game in one of those anything could happen games because of low point scores than we were really expecting. Tell me what you think about that. So I've often talked about how Football is a very variable sport, okay? And we, t- we, we throw out a lot of data and we talk about predictions. We also fully you know, own the fact that you can't really predict the result in college football because things happen that you don't expect, right? It, it's a weirdly shaped ball. It bounces funny ways, as people say all the time. Now, we think there are a lot of things that are kind of predictable in terms of how a team's going to do. Like, you know this team's not going to run well against another team or pass that well, Um we're more about just trying to establish basic quality marks, and we think you can kind of garner from the data this is a good run team or a bad run team, or this team's statistics are inflated due to competition, etc. But there's always a lot of noise, right? I mean, you can kind of get a range, but it just takes a couple busted plays to get a couple touchdowns in the game of football. Little things can can add up. And for that reason, for you to feel secure as a good team, you really need to score more than 20 points and you really need to score more than 25. I would say if you're below 25 points, if you're like a three score game at that point, it just takes two plays, you know, a kick return, a pick six, a busted coverage, one long run to make what would otherwise be a game. You'd win a game you lose. And I think a great example of that would be Oregon Auburn last year. Look, Auburn was a good team and the defensive line kept him in that game throughout it. But it's a cold, hard fact for three and a half quarters on a per play basis, on an efficiency basis, Oregon was outplaying Auburn. They had the better numbers across the board. They had, you know, they were leading in the game. It took about a half a quarter, really, for Auburn to get a couple good drives put together and to win the football game. And that's because Oregon only scored 21 points. And, And you can outplay Auburn for three and a half quarters, but if you outplay somebody in a really low scoring game, you know... Me making you go three and out and then turning around and going six plays and out, you still put zero points up and zero points up. Like it statistically, you may have done a better job, but it doesn't matter on the scoreboard. And that's why college football is a weird game. And the more points you score, the more the law of averages, so to speak, kind of comes into play where you're scoring points and they don't, or you're getting touchdowns and they get field goals. And that's that's more just a reflection of quality, you know, trading field goals for touchdowns as people talk about and like, oh, it's a shame. And if you scored more in the red zone, blah, blah, blah. That actually is kind of an expected output for quality. The concern for me here in this game with with Auburn and Kentucky, like you said, is this does kind of set up on paper to be a low scoring game. Auburn was a very low scoring offense last year. Um, in the passing game, Auburn was 97th in the country in yards per attempt. Um Kentucky was a good run defense and a stingy one. Auburn did not run the ball pretty well. Um, And so, you know, flip side, Kentucky also not a great offense. Now they get Terry Wilson back, so who knows. But if these numbers, then for everything we're talking about, the whole concern is it could be a game that's like 23-16 or 23-13. 
and anything can happen in that, especially in week one with all the weirdness we have with Auburn missing like almost two weeks of fall camp for a lot of players, a lot of crap could happen in this game. And, and even if Auburn's a better team in the whole discussion we're having, they could very well lose this game or vice versa just due to the weird nature of it and the low scoring nature of this game. Yeah, when we got absolutely dragged last year by Auburn fans when in the summer we said our biggest concern for Auburn coming into the season was their inability to run the ball. And for a Gus Miles on offense, you've got to be able to run the ball. And I don't know, like I think we were proven pretty correct on that. Yes, they ran the ball well against Alabama, but that end of the year, everybody was running the ball against Alabama. Um, I think even Charbonnet from Michigan had 100 yards. Um, so my concern coming into this is I, I think Auburn is the more talented team. That's pretty clear. And I think they're the more established team. And on paper, they should win this game big. But does it comp- is the, the whole variability thing compounded even more since we don't know if Auburn's going to be able to run the ball? I, I think that's absolutely the case. So another thing we talk about a lot is run games are more consistent than passing games. If you can run at a good clip, if you can get five yards a carry or six yards per carry in a season, um, what that allows you to do is to consistently move the chains to put together at least some solid drives in every game. And by and large, most of your championship game, you know, undefeated championship teams all run the ball well, not just because they're good teams, but that's what it takes to beat lesser teams, right? It's what lets you put away teams that aren't as good as you. And Auburn's inability to do that makes, makes you vulnerable to lose almost any game. Now, we don't know what Auburn run game going to look like, but I know it wasn't great last year, frankly. You lose Whitlow from a year ago, and your offensive line is really discombobulated. Without any scrimmages, I can't tell you if it's good or not. That's the challenge for us in this preseason. I know you may have heard from some one source or another they're good, or this site has said they're really good and they're really meshing. That is all pure hearsay, and, and and none of it's firsthand. I can't watch a spring scrimmage and tell you anything, and I don't have any returning starters in the offensive line. And again, you got returners and receiver and quarterback, but this was not an effective passing game last year at all. Um, statistically, it just it just wasn't. So I, I don't I think it is a concern for Auburn, and and likewise I will say Kentucky with um, Lynn Bowden last year at quarterback was a heavily run first team. Um, and what that allowed them to do was beat the teams they should. As I said, run games are the consistent things that let you beat, I say inferior teams, meaning teams that are worse than you talent-wise, but it also just lets you beat teams that aren't a rock against the run, you know, that aren't elite defenses. Because elite defenses stop the run against for in, against anybody. Um, we see that pretty consistently. Passing games are the things that let you beat teams with really, really good defenses because passing games can work. Um, but Kentucky... When you're playing a team like Auburn, you're not going to run the ball to beat Auburn. You're going to have to throw it. And I don't know if they can or can't, but as much as Kentucky took steps forward, I think they took steps forward because they were a run-first team that beat the teams they should or could. Um, it didn't really help them that great. The defense kept them in other games, but like Georgia, they you did put up a, a goose egg. Um, I also don't know that they're they're going to have the offensive production to score on Auburn either, so it makes it all really interesting to me. And Josh, right about now, Kentucky fans and Auburn fans are like, gosh, these guys are just hardcore negative on our teams, and it's really not about the teams. It's about the fact that we don't know much of anything about anybody at this point, point. and we've seen a lot of bad football up until now. We're hoping that the opening week of SEC is kind of football savior for 2020 because we've seen a lot of bad, a lot of rust, a lot of Big 12, 10, uh, Big 12 teams losing to, to directional schools, and then we've got Terry Wilson coming in. We don't know who he's going to be. We saw him play, you know, 2018, some good, some bad, and now we haven't had a, a proper fall camp. We didn't have spring, so... There's a lot of question marks here, and what a lot of people are going to see when we get into this is they're going to say, okay, well, let's say for argument's sake, this is one of those ugly defensive games, and it's 1913, something like that. People are going to, most people are going to say, oh, that was an ugly game. These teams are trash because we didn't see a lot of offense. You and I have always felt like low-scoring defensive games doesn't necessarily mean the team is bad. Um, so I, I don't want people to take away that. And I also think if Auburn wins this game, they're not going to get enough credit for beating in Kentucky under these circumstances that they should, especially all the practice time that Auburn's missed. But I do want to talk about real quick before I give give up 
we give our predictions, I want to talk about a positive that really not a lot of people are talking about with Auburn this year, and that's Chad Morris. So if we were fairly critical of Auburn's offense last year, and I think there's plenty of receipts on Auburn's offense last year that justifies our off-season, preseason skepticism and our being critical throughout the year, if we were fairly critical of them last year, is there a reason and would it be fair for us to be more optimistic given what Chad Morris brings to the table? For all his issues, Chad Morris does have an effective, coherent system. And I think the past few years from Auburn have suffered from a lack of, if we want to call it central vision, uh, of what they want to be. And you know, Morris did a lot to construct what today's Clemson offense is in terms of misdirection, in terms of offensive style. He's known for having a very good offensive mind. I don't think he was a very good head coach. He didn't manage a lot of things well in that situation. His personality wasn't good enough for that situation. But not being a good head coach, good head coach doesn't mean that you're not a very bright football mind. Uh, particularly in the offensive side of the ball, a lot of really great offensive coordinators are really bad head coaches. Um, I think if he comes in and just sort of establishes a clear system, then, you know, maybe Bo Nix looks a lot more like a five-star than he does. Um, you know, the the ability to have a clean, prepared route tree. You know, the uh, we've talked a lot that Auburn's offense is in many ways good at winning these games because they can generate, you know, quote-unquote cheap points as a function of the offense. But they also, you know, they don't use the full route tree. They don't make guys be open through route combinations, you know, high-low concepts, all that stuff. I know they teach it, but they don't emphasize it. Uh, and it, it kind of hurts them. I think with Morris, they may be more likely to emphasize those things. They may be more likely to have just a more consistent offensive structure. And, you know, you could see an offense. It's not going to take a lot, given how good the defense is, for the offense to be good enough to win some games or be in some big games that they weren't otherwise in. Um, and, you know, so I do think there's a positive there. Uh, and I think there's some potential for growth. It's all going to come down to the offensive line, but again, the offensive line is more of an unknown than anything. Uh, and, and we're a little skeptical in week one, but I think it could grow. And and if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and lead into my prediction on this. I mean, I think this is like a 20 to 10 game. I think Auburn wins it. I think Auburn gets some cheap points, uh, you know, quote unquote, but I think they, you know, they get cheap points like they always do. They get it as a function of the offense. Um, guys like, you know, Schwartz or Seth Williams that have a lot of explosive potential, get them points on the board, but I think it's something they're going to build on. And over the course of the season, I think it's going to be more of a consistent production thing. Um, and I think Kentucky is a good team. That's going to make this a four quarter fight, but I, I just don't think they're going to move the ball well enough. Um, and you know, it'd be interesting to see, but I, I think it's, I, I'm really curious to see if how much of a consistent ob- offense Auburn is versus their normal explosive self. Yeah, and y'all, when Josh says cheap points, I, I know a lot of like Alabama and Georgia fans when they talk about Auburn's offense, they've all they say like it's a trick play offense and they're cheap points in in a way to denigrate the offense. Josh isn't doing that. He's maintained for years that those things that look like cheap points are earned throughout the course of running the normal offense. And it's it's part of the offense, kind of like Lane Kiffin's offense was at Alabama. So don't take that as a negative because it's really not. I've got twenty four to ten, or sorry, twenty four to thirteen, Auburn on this one. Um, I could see Auburn losing this game and turn around and beating Georgia. The this part of the season is just that weird. We have talked about in the past. One of the things that concerns us a little bit for Auburn early in the year is that it has taken a while for their offense to really hit their stride even under even with like cam newton um and nick marshall they weren't the threats that they ended up being in week one two and three they just weren't so that concerns me a little bit for auburn versus kentucky in terms of not only do you have that concern that all offenses do but now you you've got a new coordinator new system that concerns me even more given the lack of practice time they've they've had to really implement it and get it humming, which is why I think we're going to see some rust. I think 24 is generous offensively, but I think they're going to score some points from their defense being solid and giving them either some short fields or some turnover points. But 
it's close enough in that score window that I'm concerned if I'm an Auburn fan or I'm encouraged if I'm a Kentucky fan. I think Kentucky is a better team than the brand pedigree that Auburn fans are going to want to be excited for on Saturday. They need to realize that this is not Kentucky from a while ago. This is only two years removed from beating Penn State uh, and winning 10 games. So, uh, you know, and they had a defense without Allen last year that was still very productive. So I, I don't think Auburn can let their guard down here. I just also think that nobody knows what to really expect. So from that standpoint, I, I I can't fully say that that I think Auburn's way way more talented. I can't fully say they're going to just blow them out of the water. Like I said, I could see them stubbing their toe here and then turn around and beating Georgia because Georgia has quarterback issues and all that. So we'll get into that in another preview. But uh, any parting shot on Auburn Kentucky before we wrap it up? No, like you said, the uh, it's kind of interesting to me because like if you talk about Auburn Georgia for example or Kentucky Georgia, uh, and I was thinking Kentucky Georgia the. I think the percentage of like difference in quality versus the percentage of the craziness of the sport, it's like 40%, 30% different in quality and 60 to 70% of the game is going to be decided by week one zaniness. Like it's, it's more, that's what concerns me if I'm either, if I'm an Auburn fan and I think Kentucky fans aren't concerned as much as hopeful, but uh, the the majority factor of this game may be randomness from week one football and all the different factors. And, you know, having a new offensive line against a good defense is never a good thing in an opener. Um, but in that regard, like you said, you, you absolutely can turn around and beat a Georgia if you're Kentucky or Auburn, even if you lose this game, either one of those teams, because I think that randomness factor is maybe the, the, the dominant factor of the game, if you will. And the margins between these teams just isn't large enough to make that factor go away. Y'all, that's it for us on this one. And I know this the tenor of this video and this conversation that Josh said I had felt negative. Um, it's not that we're negative on Auburn or negative on Kentucky. It's just that we don't know what we don't know about this season. And we don't know what kind of chaos is going to be unleashed on us in week one. We'll know a lot more after week one, but I think it's going to be three or four weeks into this season for the SEC before we really know what we have and before these teams really start to gel. So please forgive us if we were a little negative in this one. Thank you for hanging on this long. Give us your score predictions in the comments. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great week, and God bless. 